Welcome back to Practical Parenting, the podcast that helps empower parents in the trenches, find joy in the process, and thrive through it all. I'm Christina Wales here with uh, Dr. Terry Nguyen, Chair of Pediatrics at GBMC Healthcare, and my co host um, for this podcast. So um, today we're doing. Um, a microdose episode on um, following our nutrition episode about the difference between picky eating and disordered eating. Um, I think in our longer episode, we mentioned um, some of the similarities, but we also want to make sure we can tell the difference um, between the two because one needs a lot of more medical intervention um, than the other one does. So um, I first, let's say the difference or the similarities between the two. Um, So picky eating, uh, picky eaters, They have preferences for certain foods, certain textures, certain certain smells. And uh, whereas if you have disordered eating, um, it's not so much the food itself with the texture and all the sensory stuff that comes with it. It's more the, um, there's rituals. Um, so, oh, but you said similarities first. Well, I think what you're saying is they, they both, they're both as a limited, a, ma- a limited number of things you'll eat, but the difference between picky and disordered is these other layers that layer on right. top of it. Perfect. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> you interpreted my brain so well. I love you. Thank you. Um, so, yeah. So disordered eating is not just even just There's limits, there are limited foods, but then there's routines and rituals around it. How much you can eat, um, what's too much, um, you know, um, focus on um, what you're eating versus your energy expenditure. Am I exercising enough to uh, make up for what I've eaten? Um, Yeah, and perhaps... Some of those, um, they will try to eat things that are non-caloric, mm. okay? Drinking water, only water, right? Um, foods that might fill you up but really haven't much nutritional value and certainly not many calories. Um, and there's distorted body image with it. Like often uh, my patients, my young adults, adolescents and young adults who have um, disordered eating – their body mass index, proportionally weight to height, is normal. It's like at the 50th percentile, okay? Mm-hmm. But they'll tell me, I'm fat. I have a stomach. I want to get rid of my stomach. And mm. I'm kind of looking and going, what stomach are you talking about? You know? But please don't, you know, placate that youngster with, you're fine. Mm-hmm. You look great. No, that's not what they're seeing when they look in the mirror. They really are seeing that stomach that you're not seeing. They're seeing fat where you don't see it, okay? So, um, you know, you have to acknowledge, validate Mm -hmm. what they're feeling, what they think that they're seeing, and then get them help for it. Mm -hmm. Don't blow it off and say, oh, but you're fine. You look great. They don't. I mean, how many times have I had very normal, proportioned children who think that they're obese, fat, God knows what else, and what other body parts are protruding, okay? So that really is what they see in the mirror, Mm -hmm. and that's why we call it distorted body image, right? Um, They need help. I mean, they need, um, you know, a therapist to work with them on their body image and their eating. So cognitive behavioral therapy for... Um, for for eating, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's often many overlayers of, uh, it's a lot of mood disorders, anxiety, depression, maybe trauma, feeling some way that you don't have a lot of control in your life. Mm-hmm. So this is the one area that you can control is what you eat or don't eat. It's not as easy as that, right? But that's, that's a lot of it. So don't even help create that problem is what I'm saying. Um, early on, um, if you're fighting with your toddler about food, remind yourself, go, I don't want to have a kid with disordered eating in their teen, so I'm going to back off of this. How can I change what I'm doing to – and sometimes you're doing all the right things and your kid will still have an eating disorder. Okay, that wasn't your fault. You did your best, okay? Um, but there's, um, there's some really deep-rooted th- things in them that um, they feel they cannot control and 
this is the one area in their life that they've decided they can control. Um, yeah. So. Um, and developmentally, when do you when do you start seeing kids make these associations? I see a lot of it as pre-pubertal and right at around uh, puberty. So um, for girls, it's about 11 is the average age for puberty for girls. And then puberty for boys, the average age is 13, okay? And is that what I'm seeing? Yes. And the problem here is um, not a problem, but the it's just such a tricky age for, um, for our youngsters then. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they're... Their bodies are growing, and sometimes some of the kids do kind of plump out a little bit mm-hmm. before they shoot up in height. So they may think they are somehow now overweight because it's a different body, mm-hmm. you know, to what they had prior. And then with this rapid growth, some kids become clumsy because you're growing in so many areas that you can't manage your body. So you are clumsy, yeah. right? And this is when they start having that awareness of what do people see of me? What do people Mm. think of me? And then they're in puberty. So every emotion is incredibly intense, right? If I'm happy, I'm on top of the world. It's the best thing ever. If I'm sad, oh, my God, the world's going to (laughs) end, you know, and, you know, you're at at the bottom there. Mm -hmm. So all of that together is a great combo for self-combustion. Oh, sure, Um, yeah. So that's why I think some of, you know, yeah, okay, you're not happy about your body, but now you're feeling it really intensely. Mm -hmm. Like now you've tied it in with you're worthless. You're not good enough. You don't uh, don't deserve, you know, Mm -hmm. you don't deserve to live. You're not worthy to live. You're bringing down your family and your friends. You know, it's that spiral. spiral. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, that whole conglomerate of things that happen in puberty – um, it's not in the books, but I really, i that's what I'm seeing in mm-hmm. practice. It's like you have a perfectly fine child, never had any issues, and then right around puberty, uh, everything just starts going ping pong, you know, and things are really disarrayed. But what I want to say to parents is it's some of it is a, a limited phase, mm-hmm. and they will come out of it. For some children, they may need help to Mm -hmm. make it over this hump, okay? So when do you know that your child needs help to get over this hump is when their their behavior and their mood and their social interactions and maybe their academic performance is tanking, okay? That means the weight of everything on their shoulders is just way too much, and they really do need um, someone other than you to help guide them through this tunnel right now Mm because it's kind of a dark tunnel when they're in there but there's always light at the other end and for some children it's a shorter um time time period and for others it could last their whole adolescence right but i can say to parents that everybody comes out on the other side of the tunnel um 99.9 percent of the time okay so if you see these changes that you as a parent are really troubled by yeah, you're probably spot on. Mm -hmm. It's time to reach out to your pediatrician, um, your family medicine doctor, and go, I'm worried. Mm -hmm. What's going on? Um, You know, how can I help? Or what do we need to do to get help for my adolescent, my young young adult? Okay. Awesome. Well, hopefully we have helped some parents know the right direction that they need to to go in. (laughs) Absolutely. And I I really want to keep everybody... Everything is in stages. Mm -hmm. Um, Remember infancy and toddlerhood, the good and the bad last for a certain amount of time. Then we move on to the next phase. So I I encourage everyone to remember that adolescence also is a limited phase in your child's life. And all this turbulence is because they want to become independent and they need to have some of this turbulence to really figuratively cut the umbilical cord from you. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's just that some folks um, are going to have it harder than others, but they'll make it through, and so will you. (laughs) So validate your child, um, and just like you said, be with them. Meet them where they are, Mm -hmm. okay, and pull along with them. Don't push. Mm -hmm. When you're knocking heads and you're pushing against each other, nobody wins, and it's just a bigger disaster. And you're trying to preserve your relationship with your child 
during this very difficult phase, their adolescence and their young adulthood, so that you can continue to have a relationship with them in adulthood. Mm -hmm. Okay, but if you blow bombs at it now, I don't know how how easy it will be to recover mm -hmm. later on. Okay, so yeah, meet them where they are. You still have to set boundaries and limits and routines, but um, as best as you can, you know. Meet them where they are, be Alfred the butler and Batman, <laughs> you know, step back, only intervene when their life is in danger, um, and and then keep going. Stay I'm calm and carry into, on. I'm going to make that into a t-shirt, be Alfred the butler. <laughs> yeah, I like that. I'll wear it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. We'll see you next time. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.